And there we are, we're taping. So, today I'd like to do a presentation uh, on Harry Truman, President Truman, our post-war president. You will see on this slide I have S without a period, and that's kind of atypical. Well, that's because S in some way was not a normal abbreviation. Harry Truman was named for both his paternal line and his maternal line, where the family name of S came in common. Uh, but because they couldn't decide to choose the paternal or maternal line, they just gave him the middle initial S. This is just indicative of how unique Harry S. Truman is. President Truman is one of my more favorite presidents um, for some of the choices that he made in office, um, especially towards the end of World War II and the rise of the Cold War. Today, we're going to look at his domestic policies. A little bit about President Truman. First of all, he is considered one of the accidental presidents that we've had in history. Accidental in the sense that he came into power through the, if you will, a barrel of a gun. Um, because he came into power via the death of FDR, he was not elected. And when he was told about him becoming the president from Eleanor Roosevelt, he eventually is quoted as saying, I felt like the moon, the stars, and the planets fell upon me. This is true because President Truman, unlike many other presidents, didn't want to be president. He didn't want to be vice president. When at first he told the Democratic operatives he did not want to run for vice president in 44, FDR bluntly said, Harry, you are running, and that was the end of conversation. It's one of those, you serve at the pleasure of the president. And when the president says you are running, you say, yes, sir, how high? So FDR um, selects Truman, and that's kind of a, a changing course in history. Truman is from Independence, Missouri. He served in World War I with some distinction. However, he couldn't find himself after World War I. Uh, well, he's well known as being a failed haberdasher, meaning he sold men's clothes, hats, men's shaving equipment. So he had a business that failed, and people love to say that he was a failed haberdasher as indicative of him being a failure but becomes the president. Fine. If you want to roll with that, that's fine as well. Now, he does find himself into politics. He was well-liked in his region, and through Democratic political machine money, they supported him, even though he wasn't necessarily qualified to run for the Senate. He was what we considered a traditional Democrat at the time, having some progressive values, though in some ways still middle of the road. Um, because he wanted to be successful in the Democratic Party, but in the Midwest, he was a dues-paying member of the Ku Klux Klan, meaning he paid the dues to be in the Klan, though never went to a Klan meeting and is never shown in a formal sign of being a Klan supporter. But it's one of those unique things about the Democratic Party that in 1945, it, sorry, 44, it could have a senator who has paid dues to be in the Klan from the Democratic Party, yet um, within 15 years, it's the Democratic Party who are helping pushing through much of the civil rights legislation we know of today. In 1944, he was a vice president candidate. A few months later, he is the president of the United States. Now that he's the president of the United States, he has some themes to address. And some of those deal with the fact that we go from a nation at war to a nation at peace. Now that we are done being a part of World War II, we all know that we are part of the Cold War. To be part of the Cold War, we need to reorganize our defense. For example, he helps, with others of course, creates the Department of Defense. No longer do we have a Department of War. Department of War makes it sound like the Department of War is there during wartime and doesn't have a, an important role in peacetime. And we all know that's not true, especially if you're in a cold war where you sit on a war footing, you just aren't shooting guns. So besides the Department of War, he helps support the creation of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency which during the 1950s will be instrumental in our Cold War 
um, battles with the Soviet Union. The CIA, mostly known for its work abroad as international spies, the CIA should be col considered a collection dattering, data, collect data collection organization. They don't necessarily make policy. That's for the NSC. The National Security Council, led by the National Security Advisor. The NSC is there to take what the defense, the Department of State, the CIA, the FBI, takes what these organizations find and these organizations think and kind of make political strategy out of it. So they would go to Presidents Truman through Presidents Obama and try to guide them on what their foreign policy should be in keeping the United States um, safe. Now lastly, we do have the creation of what we call the Joint Chiefs of Staff. These are the heads of some of our military organizations such as the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, the National Guard, et al. So when you see that uh, Truman helped create a new reorganized defense, you can see though we are at a state of peace but still prepared for any time a state of war. And reorganization like this hasn't been done since until um, President George W. Bush pushed forward the Department of Homeland Security. And that too was after a very traumatic yet ongoing event with 9-11 and the war on terror. Okay, we're six minutes in. Make sure you're hitting pause and not only addressing the specifics I bring up, but the theme, the title of each of the slides. Moving on. Now the GI Bill of Rights. Now this is a nickname given to the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. But the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944 truly seems to define what the GI Bill of Rights was. It was a way to get servicemen, I'm doing rabbit ears right now, readjusted to, uh, reacclimated to a peacetime economy back at home. Now the GI Bill of Rights was created and supported um, during FDR's time, but it's really implemented and impacts greatly the Truman and then Eisenhower era. The Servicemen Readjustment Act provides education and training to servicemen, uh, helping them um, find maybe the college experience that's going to help them uh, lead fruitful, fruitful lives. Boy, that didn't come out clear. Uh, helps create unemployment compensation. So a, a former soldier, a GI, a former GI Joe comes back and he doesn't have to be homeless because he doesn't have a job. This is going to give him uh, about a year, if you will, of time to kind of find what he needs to do. Low interest loans. Now these low interest loans were used for homes. So you see a lot of Men buying their first home, marrying their first girl, having their first kid with a baby boom. A lot of them are moving to suburbia. Melissa's uh, grandfather, we call him Pop Pop, who dropped out of high school in ninth grade to work during the Great Depression. He will serve in North Africa and a bit in Italy during World War II. When he comes home, he hadn't seen his wife in years. They have a kid almost nine months to the day when he comes home. And they do buy their first home together soon after in a suburban area of Philadelphia known as Norristown. Thus, these low interest loans reshape where people live in America. Now, some people, through the GI Bill of Rights, get low interest loans to start a business. And a lot of the, a lot of the businesses of today find some sort of chronology timeline back to the mid-40s. Out of this comes a modern middle class. I think that this slide is one of the more important slides I'll show all year. How one law, one decision made by our government in Washington, D.C., reshapes the country we're going to become. It, this might be a liberal experiment with big government, but the ramifications allow capitalism to thrive. With, with people buying homes, moving to new places, starting up businesses, going to college, getting some sort of schooling and training. 
It's amazing, to be honest. There's my opinion. Now, of course, with every good story in America comes the bad. African Americans did not fully benefit, even though they did serve. A lot of racism at the banks and the grant councils that helped give these low-interest loans for homes and businesses um, were still led by biased, racist, prejudiced individuals, especially in uh, rural Southern and just rural America. Thus, African Americans didn't always get the loans they were asking for. GI Bill of Rights. Now, moving on. There was this massive shock to the system that was going on. You have to just get some perspective. Number one, the armed forces was 12 million one year, 3 million the next. That means 9 million people were just fired. 9 million were just laid off. Out of this, 2 million women were not needed in places like Seattle to build planes. Come on, we're talking about 10 plus million people who are going to go from A to B. How can our economy deal with this? I mean, the last time we had this type of unemployment, if you will, it was a Great Depression. This shock to the system could actually cause calamity to our economy. Our government was shrinking. People were being laid off because we did not need a big government to run the Office of Price Administration or Office of War Mobilization. O.M. Let's see what happens next. However, <laughs> America's, America's going to thrive with what we call post-war prosperity, led by the age of consumerism. I love this cartoon. Look, honey, I bought something today. Oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. And yes, it's a block. Because that's what America started becoming in the 40s and the 50s. A country where the purchasing power of individuals created jobs. For example, and I use this example uh, in class, I have a lot of teacher button-up shirts and I have a lot of ties. We are talking you know, 40, 40, 50 ties, maybe, maybe 50, probably closer to 40, and probably 50, maybe even, uh, yeah, I'll count tonight, button-up te button teacher shirts. Let's just think about it. Do I really need those? But this is the era where people buy what they want, not what they needed. So you buy one radio, and a couple weeks later, you buy a different one because it's better. I liken this to the iPhone movement. Um, I asked period two today to stand up if you have an iPhone specific, a third, maybe even more, stood up. And then I asked, sit down if you are with the same iPhone you had years ago, and only three sat down. That means 14 and 15 year olds in my classroom are on their second or more iPhones. Why? Why? Do, what, what, does it, what drastically changes because you have a different or better iPhone? This is consumerism at its best, and it's nothing to, to be upset about it. It'd be proud of the fact that the United States creates jobs for the unemployed, and we get creative and thoughtful, and we, uh, we work outside the box. Granted, it makes cartoons look, uh, look like, makes us look foolish, but the age of consumer uh, allows us to deal with the, the spending cut. The government cut spending by two-thirds before 45 and 46. This type of spending cut, if you will, caused the Roosevelt recession of 37 and 38. But this spending cut, ladies and gentlemen, actually led to unemployment decreasing because the marketplace was able to absorb all of these soldiers, all of these GIs, all of these former government workers, and even many of the women. Government spending now can increase on new sectors such as health care and education. Thus, today, the federal government's role in both health care and education can be correlated back to this 45, 46, 47 era. Now, with every post-war prosperity or prosperous America, we have to look at the problem with inflation. Now, let's take a look at the union issue of the mid to late 40s. Here's a lighthearted cartoon. Don't take it too seriously. And finally... The union contracts includes five minutes a day to, for you to smell the roses. And this is making a joke that some people feel that unions have even time cut into their day for long lunches, 
uh, lots of breaks, and even five minutes to smell the roses. This cartoon alludes to the fact that in the United States, though we've had a history of unionization, we are now having a backlash to that unionization. That backlash started in the 40s and it still goes on to today. And that's why the United States doesn't have the union membership it used to have. That's a topic for a different day, of course. Now, part of the issue was there was this massive post-war inflation caused by the fact that price controls had ended. The United States was allowed to buy all those formerly rationed goods, and the Office of Price Administration wasn't going to stop price gouging. Prices go up. Prosperity is going up. This is going to cause an increased number of strikes. Workers in southern and northern cities, they are going to want to strike because they want more money per week to keep up with that inflation. The price of bread goes up, so you want more money. Not because you want to buy 5,000 pounds of bread, but you feel that going on strike and demanding things for your union contract could help um, equate to the, the, the rise of prices. Operation Dixie is when northern unions headed to the south, a place not known for um, unionization, and started leading southern strikes. There's even famous strikes within the coal miners and the United Auto Workers. And President Truman, a Democrat, even a progressive Democrat, can't handle the level of strikes going on in the mid-40s. Like President Roosevelt, TR, these threaten the economics and stability of the nation as a whole. Truman even threatening to draft strikers. By 1946, there's a midterm election. This is the first time people get to criticize through the ballot box the policies of Truman. And Truman loses as the Republicans win. The Republicans now have power in Congress, a power they have not had for decades. This causes a lot of his more liberal ideas to be defeated. Now, what are these liberal ideas? Well, the fair deal is the name we give to them. Every segment of our population and every individual has the right to expect from government a fair deal. Like the um, square deal and like the new deal, President Truman was trying to come up with a package to help create a, co a country he thinks we need to be. Problem for him was that he did not have a Congress dominated by parties that were faithful to him. Even Southern Democrats were not happy with some of his policies. Right here you see him sitting on top of a, an egg that he needs to hatch. The egg means the fair deal legislation he's purporting. And he's saying somebody's got to hatch it, meaning he's got to do it by himself. Three elements of the fair deal that were successful were the National Housing Act, the raise in minimum wage, and national security benefits that were increased, meaning the security, uh, social security benefits that were created during the New Deal are now only going to be added to during the Fair Deal. And then they'll be added to by Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson and next, everybody says for the next four decades that social security, though a liberal ideal, is a necessity and they add more and more money to it. Now, three elements of the Fair Deal that failed was universal health care, federal money for schools, and farm subsidies as President um, Truman was uh, throwing money at the farms, also trying to make sure that we don't have a World War I, post-World War I agrarian issue like we had earlier. But these three, in pink in my video, did not succeed. All right, so the Republicans are back. They are back unlike for decades, I mean, since the 20s, are they back on the national scene? The congressional election of 1946 was a retreat from the New Deal, retreat from the war years, fear of upcoming tensions abroad and even internally. And at the end of the day, it's a general lack of support. Politically, going to war on Truman was okay. He wasn't this four-term president like FDR. He hadn't won the hearts and minds of the people. Remember, Truman wasn't even elected by the people to be the president. The best example of the Republican strength in this era was the Taft-Hartley bill. Taft-Hartley bill gets its part of its name from Robert Taft, the conservative son of 
William Howard Taft. This is also very emasculating to President Truman because he vetoed the Taft-Hartley bill and yet his veto was overridden not only by conservative Republicans but by Southern Democrats. It was an anti-union bill. First, it pushed off this concept of a cooling off period, delaying strikes, which tended to be the biggest powerful uh, strength of a union was the idea of going on strike. A cooling off period says you can't do an instantaneous strike. It banned sympathy strikes. That's when Conrad Weiser would go on strike because it feels bad for why I'm missing teachers if they went on strike. It banned secondary strikes. That's where a company that makes um, paper clips and pens goes on strike because schools are going on strike. It outlawed closed shop. A closed shop is a, a, a business that says you must join the union to be an employee. Why I'm Missing is not a closed shop. Why I'm Missing does have teachers who are in the teacher union. Why I'm Missing has teachers who are not in the teacher union. Why I'm Missing can't stop them from getting hired. Finally, um, it creates a lot of right-to-work states. Right-to-work states are simply states that um, outlaw closed shops. They are states that tend to ban strikes. In fact, Pennsylvania is one of the few states that allows teachers to go on strike, which is one of the more powerful tools a teacher union may have. Most states have said, fine, you can have strikes, but not in public education. Now, this slide is riddled with knowledge and FYIs. Please, if you're confused on the Taft-Hartley bill, Google it, Wikipedia it, it or read it in the book. Now, uh, I am almost done. The Civil Rights Movement is going to have uh, pick up some steam during the mid-40s, but it's not till the mid-50s that I believe it really catches a, a national flavor. Do remember, this is a logical beginning point for the civil rights movement. The double V campaign, fighting for rights abroad and at home. Uh, African Americans have becoming more and more urban since the great migration of the, the teens and the 20s. They're living in cities together, getting educated together, going to church together. So why not fight for rights together? NAACP and other groups uh, during World War II registered new voters. People like Jackie Robinson, though it's baseball, let's not negate the importance that, that Major League Baseball or professional sports plays on our day-to-day -day psyche. Sometimes what happens to Justin Bieber does matter because it's indicative of our feelings about our national, tr national icons. I almost said national treasure. I almost called Justin Bieber, a Canadian, a national treasure. He did desegregate... Um, Okay, a new desegregations occur of both the military and the government at the end of uh, World War II in the mid-40s. Now, of course, all this good is tied to some bad. By 1948, there's a presidential election. In red and blue and green, we have the breakdown. In red, in the election of 1948, you have all the states won by the Democrat Truman. You have the blue states, though these are largely populated, won by the Republican Dewey. That's a simple breakdown. This is a large population, so you could wonder why there's a lot of success that Dewey had up here. But what's unique about the 1948 election is the role that race came to play. For example, these are the Dixiecrat states. These were Southern Democrats that were unhappy with the liberalness of the fair deal, the support of the civil rights, and in 1948, they broke away from the Democratic Party and created the short-lived States' Rights Party. The States' Rights Party, we nickname them the Dixiecrats because they're below the Mason-Dixie line, were largely Southern states who voted for this future senator, Strom Thurmond. And this, let, let's just sit on this for a second, just because I have another two minutes before I kind of want to be done. These are future 
future Republican strongholds. This is the beginning of the end. At one time, everything here that's shown in red was dominated by the Southern Democratic Party. Remember, it was the Democrats of the South that broke away and seceded from the unions. It's the South that dominated by the president of FDR. But what's happening is slowly these people are realizing they're not as Democrat as they once were. We'll talk about this in class. Hit pause. See ya.